All right, my clock says 115, so keep everybody straight, especially Tony, who we know loves to go long. We're gonna get started. Welcome to the Marsh session. Mike, you wanna have a you wanna have a roll? I'll give you a roll, Mike. You can monitor the chat, man. You better watch it. <laughs> no, for real. I'm excited. It's gonna be fun. We've got uh, several good speakers. Uh, Tony's going to lead us off. Tony's from Chapel Hill. And you're going to tell us about eroding marshes and sediments and all that good stuff? Yes, I have. Thank you, Tony. For the three of you who don't know me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So before I begin, <laughs> yeah, I've got to go pretty quickly because I'm going to run out of time. But um, what I'm going to be presenting today is work that Carson Miller did as part of her master's thesis, and she graduated a couple of years ago and is now at the University of Texas in a PhD program. So salt marsh is effective at accumulating and storing carbon for, I think, three main reasons. One, it's composed of carbon-rich sediment because of its dense above-ground and below-ground biomass. It accumulates that sediment really quickly. Um, because sea level is rising quickly and salt marsh keeps up with the rate of sea level rise for the most part. And preservation. Salt marsh is a great environment because degradation of carbon is restricted to shallow depths. So if you're going to restore a salt marsh for its potential to sequester carbon, it's probably a good idea to know some accurate or precise estimates of carbon accumulation rates or CAR. So we look at this figure here. Um, most of my plots have carbon burial rate or carbon accumulation rates on the y-axis. Um, this is not one of my plots, but it's it's comparing all different um, soil forming environments. And some of the blue carbon environments here, you can see salt marsh has it's one of the greatest um, carbon burial rates of all, but it has a really high range. So between eighteen and almost two thousand grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And some of that range is explained by these variables. So regional differences, tidal range influences that, elevation, um, what type of salt marsh grass there is. But even within these different classifications, there's still high variability. And some of that variability is due to the method that we use to measure carbon accumulation rates. And so this is a jigger plot. Again, carbon accumulation rate on the Y, um, different methods down here. M, this is um, a marker bed. This is cesium-137, just a different type of marker bed. And you can see most of the variability in carbon accumulation rates are in these short-term yearly measurements. And there are a couple of reasons why that's the case. So these longer-term ones, you can see the variance is much lower. Lead 210, we're maybe at the decadal to century time scale. Um, century to thousand year time scale for carbon 14. So the first reason is just what I talked about before, um, carbon is very fresh at the surface. It hasn't degraded. So if you're just measuring surface carbon accumulation, you're gonna really maximize your values. The other reason is that deposition on the surface doesn't necessarily mean burial um, because what you're measuring at the surface might not get buried. It could get resuspended, um, transported out of the area. So another explanation for the variable accumulation rates is sea level rise. So we're looking at, here's a sea level curve in blue. Um, so we're going from 2000 years to about present here. And you can see that there's this increase in the rate of sea level rise right at about 1880. And we're looking at data from this core right here in Traps Bay, North Carolina. And if we look out here from radiocarbon dates, when the rate of sea level rise was low, that corresponds with low carbon accumulation rates. But all of these dates here is when, are when, is when sea level rise was much more rapid and the carbon accumulation rates are greater. And that's because sea level is creating space to for salt marsh sediment to accumulate in. And so naturally we have higher rates out here when sea level is rising more. Okay, 
but not all salt marshes are the same. And for this talk um, or this study, we focused on fringing salt marshes. And fringing salt marshes come in two main types. We have transgressive fringing salt marshes and regressive fringing salt marshes. And so what we're interested in is, do these differences in salt marsh evolution and age explain carbon accumulation rates? Okay, so a brief introduction to transgressive marshes. This is the one that most people are familiar with. Um, so here's a cross section going from land, the upland, out into the estuary. So maybe from here all the way out here. Um, so we start off with the upland forest, and then we might have a ghost forest here, high marsh, low marsh, and so when sea level rises, this salt marsh transgresses on top of the upland. And the ghost forest is kind of the leading edge of that. And this is in contrast to a regressive salt marsh. A regressive salt marsh, um, here's a picture of the Newport, and again, a cross section that goes with the picture. Um, so regressive salt marshes, they're growing out into the estuary in the opposite direction. And so we don't have this ghost forest, and you typically find regressive salt marshes in areas where we have lots of sediment loading in the estuary. Sediment accumulates, it creates um, intertidal mudflats that eventually become colonized by salt marsh, and then the salt marsh expands out into the estuary. Okay, so for this study, um, our study area is the lower half of North Carolina. And we looked at three transgressive salt marsh sites and four regressive salt marsh sites. The transgressive sites are in blue and the regressive sites are in orange. And our methods are we go out and we collect a transect of vibrocores from the shoreline all the way up to the upland boundary at each of these sites. Um, we take those cores back in the lab, we cut them in half, and we need first identify the base of the salt marsh. And so right above the base of the salt marsh, we sample a stem or a leaf from salt marsh, and we send that to the lab for radiocarbon dating. And so we're dating the age that the salt marsh first formed at that site. And then we calculate the inventory of carbon above that. And so to get a carbon accumulation rate, we just divide. So it's the inventory divided by um, this date right here. Okay, what some of the transects look like. Um, this is an example, the same photo I showed you before from the Newport. Um, here's the cross section. This is the upland. Um, this is the estuary side right here. Um, these are the first four cores from here down. And what you can see, or maybe you can't, but this is salt marsh, this is salt marsh, and it's right on top of this middle bay sediment. And if you can read these numbers, these are those age dates from the base of the salt marsh unit. And you can see because it's a regressive salt marsh, these dates are becoming younger as you move into the estuary and that salt marsh expanded. Jones Bay, this is the example I have of a transgressive salt marsh. And again, the first four cores from here out towards the estuary, this is the upland, this is towards the estuary. Um, and you can see that this is the leading edge preserved in the stratigraphy of the salt marsh. And the dates here become older as you move into the estuary. Because remember this salt marsh, it's expanding towards the upland because it's a transgressive salt marsh. Okay, so a summary of values. We also have a wide range in our carbon accumulation rate values. So it ranges from um, about 300 to 14, a large range, um, less than other studies. And that's because we stuck to that one method of radiocarbon dating. But let's look at, at that a little bit more carefully and see if we can explain some of those ranges. Um, so now again, carbon accumulation rates on the Y, this is the date that the salt marsh first formed at the site. And in blue, these are the transgressive sites. In orange, the regressive sites. So the first thing is that all the transgressive sites are a little bit higher in carbon accumulation rates than the regressive sites. And you'll see that through time, carbon accumulation rates increase as you move towards present. And some of that, it's just because the younger salt marsh, we have 
the way we're approaching this with the inventory method, as you move towards present, more of that carbon is less processed, it's fresher. Um, so that starts to maximize carbon accumulation rates out here. The other thing that's attributing to this trend is the rate of sea level rise. And the rate of sea level rise, again, increased about 1880. This is from a sea level curve nearby from Andrew Kemp's work. And that's another reason. So this salt marsh out here was experiencing a faster rate of sea level rise. And there are a bunch of outliers that don't fit that trend. So we have five transgressive site outliers here and one regressive site, regressive salt marsh outlier here. Let's, let's look at those a little bit. So the five transgressive salt marsh outliers are shown on each one of these cross sections. Um, don't worry about that. Um, but I will tell you that all of those sites, those are the youngest part of regressive salt marshes. And most of these sites are really close to the upland boundary. And so what we think is going on here is that with transgression, as we start to initially salinize those freshwater soils of the upland, they start to collapse. So the roots contract and it creates a lot of space for salt marsh to accumulate. So you can almost think of it as out here near the upland boundary, when that salinizes, you can think of it as sea level, the relative rate of sea level rise is higher out here than it is here because the land surface is going down. This site here is extremely young. I know you can't see this core photo very well, but this is where the base of the salt marsh is. Um, this is about where we took that core. Um, this salt marsh is only 10 years old. Um, it accumulated about 50 centimeters of sediment in that short period of time. And so that equates to a really high carbon accumulation rate. And the reason that's the case is because that mud flat just reached habitat for salt marsh to colonize. And so it had a lot of space once that grass colonized, it started to trap more sediment and it just grew extremely rapidly at this location. And that explains this regressive outlier. All right, another way to look at the data is instead of carbon accumulation rates, we can look at carbon density. So this unit kilograms um, per cubic meter, and again, regressive salt marshes, transgressive salt marshes, um, this axis is now age. Um, so back in time out here, here's where present is. And you can see for regressive salt marshes, as you move landward, the carbon density increases. And it's the same for transgressive salt marshes. As you move landward in this direction, remember for transgressive salt marshes, landward is a younger marsh, um, carbon densities increase. And we think that's because as you move towards that upland boundary, you have an additional source of carbon, which is the upland forest. This is also an area where rack accumulates. And so that's another source of carbon. Um, you also have less allogenic material or mineral sediment that gets to this location um, near the upland. And that's contributing to this. All right, so finally, um, I'm just gonna focus on these two points. Um, Carbon accumulation rate trends are really useful, or I think what we've presented here today and done in this study, these trends are useful if you're going to be monetizing carbon credits or at least even appraising the value of restoration projects. Um, they're not all the same and you need to take into account whether you have a transgressive or a regressive marsh and where you are in that marsh. And the final point is, um, that where carbon burial rates are the highest and we have the highest density of carbon, that's right at that upland edge. And that's commonly where we have development and um, we're kind of preventing that transgression process from happening. So that's not only reducing the width of salt marsh, but it's limiting some of the best places where carbon is accumulating most rapidly. And here's kind of a, this isn't really a plug for the work, but if you wanna learn more, you can check out this paper in communications, earth and environment. But more importantly, if you wanna grab the data set that I presented here and add to it or manipulate it, um, you can also grab the whole data set from here too. And Sea Grant, none of this would have been possible without funding from Sea Grant. They funded this entire project. Thanks.
five minutes for questions for Tony. It's like you're getting off easy, Tony. All right, sounds good. Um, thanks for coming. And joining us now is our next Molly, Molly Bos, and she's going to tell us about response to salt marsh accretion due to land use changes. All right. Thanks, John. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm excited to tell you guys a little bit about my third chapter of my PhD. Um, there's a couple of affiliations up here because this work was done while I was doing my PhD at UNC. If you want to chat with me about this, I am now at NOAA, so feel free to hit me up on my NOAA email. Um, but again, all of this was funded with my PhD through the Cape Fear, Cape Fear Coastal Recreational Fishing License Grant Program. Um, so yeah, um, this project was looking at fringing salt marshes and tidal creeks, um, and we wanted to know how marsh accretion and carbon burial responded to local watershed um, changes over time. So some calls to action slash why should we care statements. Um, tidal creeks in a general sense um, are primary nursery habitat and sedimentation was actually designated as a primary or a priority issue in the 2016 um, Carolina Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. Um, and it's still important in this 2021 amendment. Um, furthermore, Molly just gave an awesome um, synopsis on <laughs> marsh ecosystem services. So I won't go into that, but they're pretty darn cool and important for a whole host of reasons. One of which um, Tony also alluded to in his talk is this um, storage of carbon. And um, so, you know, this blue carbon is you know essentially marine stored carbon and obviously in this context i'm talking about it in terms of salt marshes um, and sedimentation and carbon burial can be impacted by land use changes in a variety of ways so this is kind of my research question um, did coastal watershed land use change impact carbon accumulation rates in tidal creek fringing salt marshes um, this is one of our field sites in Gales Creek, North Carolina. Um, if in, in case I forgot to put Josh's name on any of these great drone images, he shot all of them. He was in our lab. Um, so thanks for all the amazing images. So our field sites included 12 tidal creeks. Um, I guess the colors are a little hard to see, but just trust me, they're there. Um, we have six in Carteret County, which, um, if you're not familiar, is where Moorhead City is located. Um, and then we have six creeks in the Wilmington area in New Hanover County. Um, so you can kind of see this natural difference between five of the creeks. I'm trying to like use the mouse, but I guess it's not liking that. So these five creeks here, and then this natural delineation six through 12. And it's kind of divided by, again, you can't see it super great, but this dotted red line is um, a paleo shoreline called the Suffolk Scarp. And it basically means that all of these creek sites, watersheds were um, on old continental shelf. So they're super low relief. Um, and the basic thing I want you to take away from that is that that just means the embayments of these creek systems as a whole are gonna be much bigger and oversized for what you would expect. Um, as compared to sites six through 12, which are gonna be more um, scale with watershed area. So that kind of divides them into these tributary and size systems as we defined them, and then coastal prism and size valleys. So the tributary and size systems are those creeks one through five, and the coastal prisms are those narrower, um, more watershed scaled embayment systems. And that'll come into play a little bit more later as I attempt to explain why we're seeing some of the things we're seeing. Um, so we have a land cover record, an amazing land cover record since 1959 for each of these creek watersheds. Um, there's a lot on this, but um, the basic thing to know is that each of these slivers is a snapshot in time, a literal image that was delineated for land cover. And the biggest things to note are that the top panel is that is those Carteret County creeks one through six, and the bottom is New Hanover County. And you can basically see that the colors up top are mostly yellow, green, and this kind of like 
I don't know, orangey mustard color. And that's um, agriculture, forest, and cleared forest or silviculture, respectively. And then on the bottom panel, those in Hanover County, Wilmington Creeks, um, you see a lot of red. And that's development, which in this case is mostly suburban development. Um, so that's the biggest takeaway from this. And then to quantify kind of you know, to compare a land cover change to accumulation rates is kind of difficult. So we wanted to identify some kind of pivot point where we could use a pre-land cover change to a post-land cover change. And as you can kind of see, I'll just flip back, in these, that happens at different times um, in each of these creeks. So we couldn't just choose, say, 1950 or so for all of the creeks. So the way that we did this was we found the highest percent contribution to accumulative change in the watershed. So for instance, in this case, this is Whiskey Creek in Wilmington. And we looked at, you know, them on a decadal scale. We found that between 1959 and 1969, there was an increase in more than 15% of developed land cover. So we put a midpoint in there in 1964, and that's the divider between a pre and post major land cover change. Acronym is all over the paper too, um, which is frustrating. But these are the images. Oh, you can't really see the image super great, but this, these are just examples of the imagery that we use that it looks like. Um, so the, the top kind of black and white image is the 1959 data for Whiskey Creek. Um, so, you know, there's nothing really there. And then that other image is 2016, the most recent. So very developed. So like I said, we did sedimentation rates. So of course we had to take sediment cores. Um, we also took elevation measurements on the marsh surface, vegetation surveys, um, and then I did let you 10 to um, get these sediment accumulation rates. The culmination of all of that work is basically shown in this graph here. Um, don't get bogged down by colors and things like that, but um, we have them separated into tributary and size valley systems, which again are those low relief systems that were on old continental shelf. Um, big embayments, things like that. And then the coastal prism systems are those ones in Wilmington plus number six in Carter County that drain across that paleo shoreline. Um, and the biggest thing to take away from this is you can see, you know, lots of variability in mass accumulation rates, which is on the y-axis in tributary systems. And the mass accumulation rates seem to reach higher maximum values at those creek sites or marsh sites, sorry. and the coastal prism systems, you know, have this steady mass accumulation rate through time. Um, and you can generally see that in the later part of the record for tributary and sides valley marsh sites, um, they look to be much higher in mass accumulation. But I won't bog down too hard in mass accumulation rate because we really wanted to know about some carbon um, information. So here's the, the kind of more raw carbon data for carbon density which we use the mass accumulation rates from the previous slide, you know, multiply them by these and we can get carbon accumulation rates. Um, and so this graph on the right shows um, carbon accumulation rates for each of the creeks. And we are missing a couple here, um, either for the reason that the, you know, sediment accumulation rates didn't work out because the sediment might've been mixed. Um, there's also a creek that are a marsh site where the watershed didn't actually have a defined um, major land cover change. So we excluded that from this particular plot too. But generally speaking, one through four are the tributary systems, six through 12, coastal prism systems. And the orange um, box and whisker is the pre-major land cover change for each of those. And then the date is kind of hovering in italics above it. And then the black and gray bars are the post major land cover change. So the big takeaways from this plot are that check our rates are similar to other to other nearby locations, which Tony actually presented that paper a few minutes ago. So that's nice to see. Some of our rates are a little bit lower, especially in the early part of the record. Um, but overall, the black bars are all to the right of the orange bars. So there's some level of acceleration in carbon accumulation rate after a major land cover change. Um, however, not all of them are significant. So where those boxes overlap, that means they're not significant. Um, and so what we see that's interesting is that these top four 
are the tributary systems and all of those are very far apart. So they accelerated a lot after that land cover change in carbon accumulation. And then six through 12, those boxes are much closer together. So the acceleration wasn't as obvious or as big. And in fact, three of those sites didn't accelerate a significant amount after a major land cover change. So I'm going to try to explain some reasons why we think that is. Um, so we looked, you know, you have to look at controls on marsh sedimentation and carbon stock. So we calculated um, inundation based on astronomical tides, which again is a super basic, you know, mean high water marsh elevation and mean low water type of um, calculation. We found that in general, inundation was a lot higher in these six through 12 um, marsh sites, but you'll notice there's some negatives in there, which really make no sense um, because marshes, we know there's spartine alternate flora there. So we know it's inundated enough to sustain a marsh. Um, and so we think that this is mostly because those um, creek systems in Carteret County up near Moorhead City are again, those big embayments, they are further from inlets. They do have a lower tide, astronomical tidal range in general, but we think they're mostly wind driven. Um, and so these are likely kind of false inundation fractions for um, those drivers. Whereas in Wilmington, all of those creeks are really close to inlets um, and their inundations kind of make more sense with marshes. So the astronomical calculation makes a bit more sense for them. So we also looked at stem density, but again, it's hard to look at stem density and compare any of that to long-term sediment accumulation rates because we only counted stem density in 2016. We don't know what stem density was in 1950 or 1900. So that um, information is kind of taken with a grain of salt. Um, another reason we think that the carbon accumulation rates might be higher in those tributary systems is that simply the supply of the sediment type is different between the two locations. We didn't look specifically at sourcing them with, you know, isotopes or anything like that, but um, we do know that there's organic rich hydric soils in Carteret County as compared to the New Hanover Creeks, which again, drain across that paleo shoreline, which is very sandy in New Hanover County. So I can't really talk about, um, marshes without saying whether or not they're doing okay compared to sea level rise is kind of a tangent away from carbon but um we looked at you know relative sea level rise which is on the right um compared to sediment accumulation rate because those are in the same units and basically what we find or what we found is that the sediment accumulation rates were all lower than the rate of sea level rise at site at all sites except for two which would suggest to us that like uh oh these marshes are not doing so hot they're probably drowning, um, but this may or may not be true because we also looked at elevation um, compared to local mean sea level, which is on the right, and all of the elevation um, measurements on the platforms of the marsh, except for one, were higher than local mean sea level. So we're kind of hypothesizing that these marshes might just have some elevation capital and be high enough in the tidal frame that you know, they look like they may have been doing poorly, but maybe these land use changes dumped a bunch of sediment, they popped up really quickly, and now they're just too high, and the rates are lower now. Um, but again, difficult to say. Hypothesis. Okay, so I showed you a lot of graphs, um, but essentially, my research question was, did land use change impact accumulation rates, essentially? And yeah, they did. They accelerated um, through time at most of the sites, at least the sites that saw a you know defined major land cover change as we um, defined it. So we also found that there are some differences between valley types um, where the marshes were, where the marshes were. So the coastal prism in size valleys, those narrower valleys with smaller embayments. Um, they had lower mass and carbon accumulation rates in general. Um, but again, we think that a lot of that might have to do with the supply, um, that sandy supply from across that paleo shoreline could be um, impacting that. As well as things like, again, stem density, but grain of salt for that thing. Um, 
So these tributary incised systems had these higher accumulation rates and carbon accumulation rates. And we do think that this is largely driven by, you know, this difference in inundation and this kind of conundrum between, you know, the astronomical calculation not really working out. We think that it's, it, it's obviously inundated more frequently than a negative, um, but that might also be contributing in making the basin more turbid and providing more sediment to the marsh platform when it's actually flooded. So generally carbon accumulation rate accelerated after a major land cover change, as I saw those black bars were to the right of the orange bars. Um, they were not significant for some of those coastal prism in sized valley systems. And so um, when talking about, you know, management implications for if you're going to manage for different types of land cover change, I mean, maybe these suburban development land cover changes aren't increasing carbon accumulation rates as fast. I'm not a great chemist, so I wouldn't know exactly why that would be the case, but um, in this case, that's what we found. So this funding was, again, from the Coastal Recreational Fishing License Grant Program, and um, yeah, and these are the people that helped me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have a few question time. Anyone have one for Molly? Nothing no. online. Oh, now we got some, there we go. Great talk. Um, thank you. So how can you translate this information to like carbon storage on the long term and yeah. that type of information that will be useful for people who care about sequestration? Um, I'm trying to think of the fastest way to answer that. Um, Cause yeah, that's basically what my job is now. So still learning how to do the management side of things. Um, but you know, I think this data definitely shows that there's lots going on with carbon stock and what you can expect in different, both valley types and also, you know, different types of land use change over time. Um, I think the interesting thing for Wilmington, this might be a tangent, not really answering your question, but is that a lot of those creeks sites are, the watersheds are basically maximum developed, you know what I mean? And so, I don't know if you guys noticed part of the issue was that we had these increases and then it kind of like tanked um, after that. And so there's lots to consider. Like, you know, we have these high rates at some point, but that doesn't necessarily mean they'll get back to that. And so calculating how to project those into the future can be kind of complicated because of that. Um, but in terms of stock, I mean, that's pretty easy to do. You just calculate stock. But in, if you're trying to project from a future project, like if we were thin layer placing on these, you know, it'd be hard to, they would be very different basically because the tributary systems aren't as impacted in those watersheds as the Wilmington Creeks are. It'd be hard. Um, <laughs> for, I guess all of your sites, but were you always like coring from the same like dominant plant species or like was it the same thing dominant in all of those marshes? Spartina, uh, marsh. yeah, we selected for Spartina. Well, we wanted to go 10 meters in. We also wanted it to be nice. So we did not pour in a Junkus marsh. Um, well, there was Junkus just upland of the, mm -hmm. where we were. Okay, um, but so yeah, so it was all like 10 meters from the marsh edge. So we also, the other criteria was it had to be adjacent to our creek core, which I also did the creek cores for this. That was a whole other part, but it was, those were the two criteria. It was, yeah, Got Spartina, it. all Spartina. Got it. Or Sparopolis, do people call it that? Okay. <laughs> no, that's not allowed in here. <laughs> Anybody else on you? Um, so I was wondering if there was any management approaches, differences between these two types. So we've got that valley and that um, kind of broad basin prism and how 
for like, say a management of like thin layer placement, or should we, these areas are obviously they're way built out and they will have some critical tipping point where they will drown or something. Yeah. So does this give you any sense or can you take a stab at where we should go uh, for that um, approach? Should we be doing like migration kind of buying out or should we think yeah, to apply sediment and let them build up? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like for the Wilmington creeks, there's not anywhere for the marshes to really scoot upland. Um, so that would definitely be a harder place to manage for lots of reasons, permitting also, because they're people's backyards, you know, there's the whole private property issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I think maybe it'll be easier to manage for in Carteret County, um, just because those marshes are a lot wider. And I think they're kind of more typically what people are working on restoring marshes kind of. Um, but I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's hard to say, <laughs> I guess for thin layer placement. Yeah. I mean, you could try that in Wilmington, but again, you know, those, these marshes may or may not be doing poorly right now. I mean, the, you know, they're being inundated frequently and then Yes, they are accreting in the last 50 years slower than sea level rise, but they are technically, you know, they have that elevation capital. So maybe they're not doing so bad. Um, I guess we'll just stay tuned. Monitoring efforts, perhaps. Okay. Thank you, Molly. Thanks. Okay, we've gotten the Mollies passed, and now we're going to move on to Christina, who's here from UNC Wilmington, and she's going to tell us about a grazer of the marsh, the periwinkle, periwinkle snail, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. I know it can be tough after lunch on the last day of a conference. So I appreciate you all sticking around for my talk. Um, we are going to be sticking with in-salt marshes, but we're going to be taking a little bit of a different direction. Uh, so today I'm excited to present to you all a portion of my PhD dissertation, which is exploring the um, interaction of parasite infection and predation cues on a keystone grazer. Um, and like Dr. Fierce said, I'm a PhD candidate at UNCW in Dr. Stephanie Kamel's lab. So as a behavioral ecologist, I am interested in intraspecific trait variation. Uh, so one of Darwin's fundamental insights was that many conspecifics within a population vary substantially in many traits, and we can kind of visualize this with height. We know that people vary significantly in their height, and we also know that this trait is heritable, uh, which means that natural selection can act on it, which is an important aspect of uh, evolutionary theory. Um, unfortunately, lots of studies, not unfortunately, but lots of studies focus on population, population level patterns, oftentimes missing um, really interesting individual level patterns. And so the trait that I am interested in, in is behavior. So um, like other traits, uh, individuals can differ significantly in their mean behavioral expressions. And also like other traits like height, um, we now know from lots of different studies that uh, behavioral expressions are her heritable. Um, and so GAMI 2006 found that um, they were able to, to specifically select for the trait of aggressiveness in mice over several um, generations of these mice. And so we have evidence to support that like many traits, behavior is also heritable, therefore um, important for natural selection and evolution. And so the um, trait and the patterns of behavior that I am interested in are behavioral tendencies that differ across individuals yet are consistent within individuals over time. And, over time, and this is termed animal personality. There are five main axes of personality. We have aggression, boldness, activity level, exploration, and sociability. Um, I mainly study boldness, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, and that is defined as an individual's propensity to take risks. So an individual that is bold is an individual that is going to be going out of their way in, in a risky environment and taking those risks, whereas shy individuals are going to choose to um, not take risks. So studying personality is important for a variety of different reasons. Um, it can impact population growth and persistence, uh, community dynamics, as well as species interactions, which go on to affect 
overall uh, ecosystem functions in important ecosystems like salt marshes. And so I am interested in the intraspecific trait variation um, of a very common and important invertebrate in salt marshes, literary errata marsh periwinkles. Those of you who have talked today are probably very familiar with these guys. Um, you probably see tons of them. Um, they're very abundant. They live very closely with conspecifics within the grasses of Spartina. Um, and Spartina provides a suite of functions for these snails. So one of the things that Spartina provides is a way for snails to climb vertically out of the water. So salt marshes are tidal ecosystems with every incoming high tide. We've observed that marsh periwinkles will climb up the blades of grass off of the marsh floor. And then when the water goes back out, the snails will retreat back down to the marsh floor. Um, and there are lots of hypotheses as to why this is something that we see. Um, and the one with the most evidence is that this is a predator avoidance strategy. So many studies have investigated this and when snails are tethered to the marsh floor and unable to climb, um, over 80% of those snails end up getting eaten specifically by blue crabs. And so this is a really important behavior for this species. And even though this is a very important behavior, um, there's very, very limited data on the individual level. So most, most data um, in this species is like here in this graph, a uh, population level. Um, so this figure is taken from a paper looking at climbing height between two different populations of snails and its population level. And although it, it provides an interesting snapshot of information, you can see by the distribution of points that there is significant variation within those populations. And so that is what I'm interested in investigating in this species. Um, and so this is, like I said, part of my dissertation. My first chapter, I'm going to try to review it pretty quickly right now to give everyone a good framework, looked at personality in marsh periwinkles. And so I found that individual snails were very consistent in their climbing height, so in their behavior, yet individuals differ consistently or differed um, within the population. And so that fits our definition of animal personality. And this figure here, every point is an individual snail and their average um, behavior for what they did across three trials. And as you can see, we have a distribution of climbing height. We have some individuals that consistently did not climb, whereas some consistently did climb. And so we, um, we say that individuals that do not climb and they stay in the water are bold. Um, and that makes sense. They are um, potentially risking encountering a predator, whereas we have individuals that will climb and, and they are choosing to get out of there. They're like, I don't want to see the predator. We're not doing that today. Um, I also found a repeatability of 0 0.20, which statistically supports um, the presence of personality. And what this means is after controlling for a variety of factors, um, we find that 20% of the variation remaining um, is due to differences among individuals. Um, so we have really nice evidence here of this phenomenon in this species. And my study is one of the first to actually explore this, which is really fun. Um, I also found a variety of different things. I found um, that individuals exhibited um, differences in other aspects of personality, like plasticity and predictability. And we found some really nice correlations among those uh, aspects of personality as well as with morphology. And unfortunately, I don't have time to get into that today, but this paper, a little plug for myself, will be published in January of 2023 in Animal Behavior. So if you find this topic interesting, I encourage you all to keep a lookout for that paper. Um, but this sets the framework for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and one thing that is pretty interesting about this species is that they are the first intermediate host to a variety of different trematode parasites. Um, and so you can see here, they get infested. These are uh, called cercaria, um, and they are very important for the life cycle of these parasites. Recent work by Morton and Silliman found that snails infected with trematode parasites did not climb as much and did not graze as much, which are two really important behaviors ecologically in this species. Um, so marsh periwinkles are pretty unique in that they are fungal farmers. And you can see here in the middle, um, they can do considerable damage to the blades of Spartina when they are grazing. Um, and Morton had in 2002, I believe, found that when densities of snails are not regulated by predators, they can decimate large areas of Spartina. Um, and this photo here taken on the right, um, we see that this rightmost panel has the highest prevalence of parasite um, parasites in the snails. And you can see that it co co corresponds with um, the largest amount of above ground biomass. So what they're hypothesizing is that um, the snails, if there's high prevalence, they do less damage to Spartina, therefore affecting overall ecosystem function. Um, and so I wanted to investigate this a little bit more, but on an individual level, because like I've said a few times now, many studies do not look at this individual level 
patterns. And so I wanted to explore whether behavioral expression and response to risk will vary among individuals as a direct result of infection status. And I wanted to determine if the presence of an infected individual will modify the behavioral responses of uninfected conspecifics. So to do so, I went up to Atlantic Beach and I collected 233 individuals adjacent to the Bogue Sound. They were brought back to the Center for Marine Science where they were measured um, their length and aperture length, as you can see here, and then they were individually marked so we can keep track of who was who. Um, I then ran a series of experimental uh, behavioral assessments, um, and this included a bucket that was marked, oops, sorry, marked um, 29 centimeters tall, um, and I marked it every centimeter so I could accurately assess height climbed, and then I added three centimeters of water to the bucket. Um, I looked at a bunch of behaviors for this chapter, but I'm only going to focus on two, which is climbing height and time out of water. Um, and so in order to measure these, we randomly put five individuals in the bottom of the bucket. We gave them five minutes to acclimate. And then a 10 minute trial would begin where we would mark their height climbed to the nearest centimeter every two minutes for 10 minutes. Um, and then we also would calculate the proportion of time spent out of water to get this idea of latency. And this was repeated three times per individual, which is a really important aspect of personality studies is repeated measures within individuals. Um, I then repeated the same process, um, but instead of using filtered seawater, I added water from a tank holding a blue crab, and that was to introduce predator cues. Um, then I needed to do, determine if these snails were infected. And so I started off by leaving snails to dry for 24 to 48 hours. Um, then they were placed into individual wells along with heated seawater. Um, those well plates were then placed under a fluorescent light for at least two and a half hours. Um, and this basically physiologically stresses them out and it makes them shed out any cercaria that would be in their body, allowing me to determine if they're infected. I would then screen them uh, with a dissecting scope for it's kind of hard to see in here, but this is a cercaria um, looking for that to determine if they were infected. And this process was repeated three times over about three weeks to try my best to ensure that they were classified correctly. So moving straight into results, um, when I break down the snails into infected versus uninfected, we found no differences in both of the behaviors measured. So we did not find that there were any differences in height climbed and proportion of time out of water, as you can see by these figures here, um, which does not coincide with previous research um, on the population level. Um, in terms of more patterns of repeatability, um, this study also found an overall repeatability of 0.18, which coincides nicely with the first study. Um, and what this means is, again, nearly 20% of the variation um, after controlling for a bunch of factors is due to variation among individuals. We also saw the same pattern, like that very first graph, of some individuals being consistently bold, where others were consistently shy. Um, so our results are lining up quite nicely with the first study. Um, but as we started analyses, um, we realized that we could uh, separate our um, snails into three groups. So snails that were tested um, in groups of uninfected individuals only, snails that were tested um, in groups of uninfected with infected, and then groups that had only infected individuals. Um, and as we started our analyses, we found that this these groupings actually were very important in determining several, several aspects of personality. Um, so here we have a figure looking at repeatability is on our Y, and then we have our two uh, behaviors, height climbed and time out of water. Um, and what we found is that as the number of stressors increase, so being infected and being in the presence of a predator queue, our repeatability increased along with it. So you can see here that infected individuals in the presence of a predator queue um, had the highest repeatabilities between 0.5 and 0.6, which is actually quite high for any type of personality study. Um, and so what this means um, is that whatever that individual does, whether it's they're bold or shy, they're becoming extremely precise when they're, um, when they're infected and when they're in a risky environment, um, which has interesting uh, environmental implications. So I know this looks scary, but I'm going to explain it. Um, next, I want to talk about plasticity. So behavioral plasticity is the shift of behavior within an individual over environments. So in these plots here, each one of these lines is an individual snail, and it is um, their shift in behavior in uh, the presence and absence of a cue. And then again, we have our three groups. So we have our three panels of types of snails. Um, and so what we found is that being infected didn't necessarily um, impact your plasticity. Um, so it didn't change what you did. Um, but we did find that who you were hanging out with did change what you did. So if you focus here on the uh, rightmost panel, 
and specifically on the red line. So all of the red lines up here are the boldest individuals within that group. And what we're finding is that the boldest individuals that were uninfected had the largest degree of change, so the highest slope, um, when they were surrounded by an infected individual. Um, so what this is telling us is that um, infection is not necessarily driving any patterns in the personality, but it's in, um, it's uh, impacting the personality of uninfected individuals, um, which means that social context matters. And this is kind of an idea that no one um, really has thought about in the species before. And so this work has illuminated that not only do we need to look at individuals and what they're doing, we need to look at who they're with. And so um, just to wrap up conclusions, um, again, infection status and context does influence repeatability values like we saw, but it does not necessarily directly influence behavioral type or plasticity, um, but the presence of infected individuals does. So the social context is an important thing in this species. And so you guys have heard lots about salt marshes today, um, but this is an ecologically important species. They have this ability to decimate Spartina if, they're or if their densities are not controlled by predation, by blue crabs that George talked lots about today, and they are very important. And one of the main things that mediates the interaction between blue crab and snail is behavior. And so my goal is to try and understand these behaviors better um, in this ecosystem that has this key predator-prey relationship. Um, and I also would like to um, argue that I, I believe personality should be integrated into, so to speak, our ecological tool belt of how we look at these ecosystems. Because like I've mentioned, um, individual variation in behavior is very often many times overlooked. It is not considered as important. Um, and I, I believe my work highlights that this species that everyone knows and sees is actually much more complicated and complex than we have thought. And so I hope that the rest of my dissertation um, illuminates these, these patterns. And I hope that this work can be integrated into future management decisions. Um, I just wanna to touch on some other work I'm doing. So I'm hopefully at the end of my PhD, we'll be able to tell you about geographic variation in personality, more social context, which was an added bit because we didn't know that was important, which is always fun. That's why I love science. Um, and then survival of the fittest. Um, does personality affect survival in the lab and in the field? Um, and with that, I would like to thank my advisor, doc Dr. Stephanie Kamel, my committee, all my funding sources, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know much about behavior and I couldn't tell from this, but when you, you said you did three trials, was it the same group of five snails for each of the three trials? Yeah. So it was the same group of five snails um, per each of the trials. And in our first study, we actually found that group did not matter at all. So they were not influenced by their group, but we also had zero infection in that first set of snails because I dissected all of them to see if they were infected. Um, then with this group, like I said, because of our experimental design, we didn't know who was getting linked up with who because we were checking for infection after we set up, after we did the behavioral trials. And so that's how we ended up with those um, differing group types. And so they were consistent with who they were with, but we just had those three different group types. Got it. And so like, do they not infect, like if, for the ones that's like infected and uninfected, like, do they not infect each other or is that? Yeah, that's a great question. They cannot infect each other. So okay. um, their sicaria can only infect the next stage of the parasite life cycle, which is usually a crab. Um, so they cannot directly infect each other, but um, there's evidence in other species of snails that they can actually tell when an, another individual is infected via their mucus trails. Um, so they can kind of like gather information from those. Um, and though we know they can't get infected, um, obviously they don't know, they might not know. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Nicholas. I'm with Duke. That was a great presentation. I wanted to ask if you might dive into more about the social context. Um, I'm curious how having a, an infected individual in your company or your proximity would affect your behavior. And, and maybe you just answered it with the mucus trails, but yeah, if you could speak more to that. Yeah, so in terms of them um, figuring out that there's an infected individual, like I said, the mucus trails is most likely the mechanism that we can find in the available literature that does need more um, investigation, but that's um, kind of our best guess. And then in terms of why they would want to avoid being in the water when there's an infected individual, it we hypothesize that it could be um, like perceived risk. There is a sick 
you know, individual in the group, maybe that is going to impact their chances of survival when they are in a high risk environment. That it? Okay, thank you, Christine. Thank you.